This unprepossessing mound on the Isle of Sheppey may not look much, but underneath here are the remains of the last great royal palace of the medieval period. Queenborough Castle was built by King Edward III for his beloved Queen Philippa, and by all accounts it was a very impressive and important building, although strangely very few images of it remain, and those that there are seem to contradict each other. Some give it round outer walls, for instance, others give it square ones. So what was it like? And um, what was it for? Was it essentially defensive? Or could it have been a retreat from the plague, which was currently sweeping through Europe? As usual, we've got just three days to come up with some answers. was built at Queenborough on the Isle of Sheppey in Kent in 1361. It's located at the end of the creek running from the River Swale. Queenborough itself was the last royal new town of the Middle Ages and was built by Edward at the same time as his castle. Oliver, we've got all these conflicting reports of what the castle looked like. Which one do you favour? Well, we've got a couple. We've got this interesting elevation, which is by Wenceslas Haller, 1640s. I think we can rely on him. He's a good artist, isn't he? I think so. It looks pretty believable to me. But I think really interestingly, we have this, this plan. A couple of hundred years after the castle was built, around here we seem to have a perfectly circular moat. Just inside that, a circular curtain wall. Within that, another range of masonry structures, very much like a rotunda. Over here, I think, we just about pick out a gatehouse and on the other side an inner gatehouse. But the problem is we don't actually know what the scale of that is or indeed what the orientation of it is. I love this little round thing in the middle, what's that? Seems to be the castle well as far as we can guess. If you look behind us, yeah. we think it's over here. Cool. <laughs> Presumably we're going to have to wait for ages while John does his GFAs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does yeah mean? Well, you'd think such a big target would be quite easy. Yeah. Uh, the site isn't easy from our point of view. There's lots of clay, there's lots of modern disturbance on top of that yeah. clay. It's going to take us a while. So are we stuffed? No, because I think topographically we can, we can yeah. start. Because of the way it's a sort of dome-like structure, yeah. it drops away on each side, that we could just go with the topography. We can go from more or less the middle where the well is, straight down the slope. Tear along the dotted line, this would be. Not very straight, Phil. There's nothing wrong with a spray can, it's to take the end straight. The medieval well lies under this concrete cap and gives us the centre point of the plan. We're going to try and work out the scale of this unique castle by placing Trench 1 across one section of what should be the rotunda, which is the part of the castle housing all the important rooms bedchambers, formal rooms, chapel, kitchens and dining rooms. This is it. That's it white and yellow. Let's have a look, Phil. But I think that's probably a tile. Might be medieval tile, of course. Yeah, so. You can see there's sort of clay inclusions yeah. in it and the edge of it. Yeah. But... While Trench 1 gets going and Geofiz start working their way around the mound, I'm interested to find out why Edward chose this location for his castle. The context is one of the many wars with France, the most famous, the Hundred Years' War, the longest of the lot, very much Edward III's great project. If Sam's right, and the reason for the castle was the Hundred Years' War, then surely it wouldn't be stuck inland here. It would be out here on the coast. Well, when the castle and town are planned, it's all part of one functioning unit. The castle's here because you need room to lay the town out around the harbour, which is like the pivot of its commercial interests. So the castle is both protecting the natural harbour and it's allowing the town to be built around it so it can attract all the income that goes with it. But isn't this a 19th century map? Can you really construe what was going on in medieval times from that? Oh, I think you can because with a single high street from the castle, wide at one end, which is where you have the markets, divided off either side into long, thin plots. This is a very typical medieval street plan. It's kind of fossilising patterns of the past. Whoa! There's a pipe. 
In Trench 1, Phil's finding it slow work as he picks his way through unmarked utilities. He had much of a pipe. Yeah. He's all full up with muck, so I don't think he's very, very important. Do you want to drop down in front of it? The people of Queenborough are keen to get involved, and one of the many spectators has brought us one of her heirlooms to look at. So what we've got here is this beautiful replica of the castle keep, you said. Yes, yes. Could you explain a little bit more about how, how you came to have, you know, this absolutely, I mean, it's stunning. Well, my grandfather bought it from a house sale in Queenborough about 150 years ago. Mm. The man that lived there was a cabinet maker and he made several items, this being one of them. Apparently, the wood was from the castle itself. I'd played with this as a little girl. It was my doll's house. And now your granddaughter's playing with it as well. And my well. granddaughter's play with it. And do you play with the queens in the castle? Yes. She sleeps right in there. And when she gets up, she goes down here and has her breakfast. Oh, fantastic. And she goes on holiday sometimes. <laughs> Some of the castle wood may have survived in this model. But we don't know how much of the structure was left after Cromwell's parliamentary commissioners tore the castle down and sold it off in 1650. But by lunchtime, Phil's beginning to get some answers. I mean, I think what you're looking at is literally the robbed out wall. You see, look along there, you see where the, the brown stuff steps down? Yeah. I reckon that's the outside edge of a wall trench, and I think we've got another one in the section on this side. And look at the stone that's in it. We've got that, which is a nice blue piece of moulded stone. And this looks like that yellowy-white Yorkshire stone. Ah, well there, then, how about that, then? Oh, that's even better, yeah. I bet that's the magnesium limestone, That's isn't it? it. I bet that's it. And there's the green sand as well. Which is from Rygate, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Well, that's all the building materials that's recorded, isn't it? Have we any idea which wall of the castle this is, though? Well, I'm assuming it's part of the rotunda. I is. think it's the inner wall, because oh, I think it's coming round here. Yeah. And I think the outside wall is probably going to come down, or oh, I don't know, probably somewhere round here. Right. So what do we do now? I've got a little job for you. You come over here. Oh, beware of men with little jobs, <laughs> Tony. <laughs> You know, we reckon this was the well in the middle. Yeah. Right, well, Stuart has, a, has measured out on the plan and he thinks this, this rotunda, this big tower on the top, is 40 metres across. Right, yeah. So if you take the end of this and run out 20 metres... Yeah. Hang on a sec, and I'll stop you. That'll be the radius of the tower. A bit more. That's it. Take that rope round and keep the tape taut. Right, sir, can you move Henry's what's it for me? On a bench tone. That's it. Great. Well done. I bet you're knackered now, aren't you? So what did that prove? Well, I think what it proves, if you look at it, that it's a hell of a big structure. It's a lot bigger than I thought it was. So what are we going to do about it? We've got to go and talk to Stuart now. Yeah. Because we're going to dig another hole. We're going to lie down first. <laughs> Stuart, that's a heck of a big building on the top there from your measurements. Big royal castle, isn't it? Are you sure <laughs> your calculation's right? I think so, because the evidence we've got from the mapping gives us a set of concentric circles which are here in the landscape. So we've got the inner part there. Then just there where the tape dips down, you've got an earthwork going round in a curve around there, which was actually measured and put on a map. Yeah. And then outside that, beyond the paper cup, it dips and rises up again, which is what the map showed as a moat. So all the evidence says, yes, that's the, that's the right measurement. Right. Look, that dotted line is the line you've just run around. Yeah. Right. The red is the high resistance, stone rubble, for the inside of the castle. Then we've got courtyard, the outer wall, and then the ditch beyond. I mean, what? Stuart and I were thinking a long trench yeah. along that line. That's where we've put the tape on the ground. So we'll be inside the castle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hang on, come look at this. That's, are you saying that we do a trench which starts here and goes... I'm not doing any more running. Go right. All the way down to there. All the way down there. Yeah, you got yeah. it in one. Yeah. Yeah. Trench two should give us the scale of the castle by stretching from the rotunda to the curtain wall and the moat beyond. Oh, 
Back in Trench 1, Phil's working on the rotunda wall that he found earlier. I mean, that looks better, doesn't it? Oh, doesn't it? Oh, there's that big stone, too. I mean, what the devil? We got stone down here that might just be in situ. I think we've actually got part of the wall. That's just not one random stone down no, here. No, 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 no. Listen to me. Look, there's one stone comes along there, and then there's this whacking great piece here. There's another stone there. Bridge, I reckon we got King Edward's Castle. Oh, that goes on, ah, it goes on down underneath there. Well, see, if that does curve round. What part of the castle does this make it then? The only that it might be the curving bit. <laughs> <laughs> if our plan's accurate, the castle's full of curving bits, so Phil's could be any of these three shapes. The angle of it suggests one of the towers, but that would make this an outside wall, which would surely mean the rotunda was too small to fit all the rooms in. The 2D plan of the castle is difficult to visualise, and as a 3D architectural model, it's beginning to look pretty peculiar. It's lovely, and I don't want to be cruel, but what's the point? Well, a model like this, it's a, an excellent device for letting us really visualise what is a castle with a, with a unique concentric design. We have a wonderful description contemporary with these plans, particularly the one by the Parliamentary Commissioners, who describes the castle as being circular, built with stone, with six towers and certain out-offices thereunto belonging, within which circumference of the aforesaid castle is one little round court paved with stone, in the middle whereof is one great well, which gives you precisely what we've got in the plan and the drawing. It is a funny looking thing, isn't it? It certainly is. It's, it's an odd looking castle, no two ways about it. However, I think it's also important to remember that it's a castle that would have been a, a very impressive icon of Edward's authority. We know that a man called Henry Yavell, a superstar of his time, was employed um, in the works um, and a num number of other very, very high status masons. So really only, only the best were used here at Queenborough. On the mound, Phil's hunting for more of his rotunda wall. Look at that. Very good. Ain't that a praise be the oh, Lord? Oh, yes. What are you giggling about, Phil? Oh, look, the most amazing, amazing find. He's just chopped a bit of clay away from that side and he's got the other side of the wall. Look at that. Show Brilliant. Us. Hey? Show me. Look, let me take you back to here. We've got the wall coming down here and it comes along there. And then when it gets to there, it turns back on itself. So it looks like the actual front of the wall is built as a sort of series of lobes. Yeah. But what we're really getting excited about, look, we've got the back edge. And it's why it's about two metres wide, isn't Absolutely it? Absolutely cracking, isn't it? It's a yeah. zonking great wall, isn't it? I know, I never thought we were going to get that. In addition to attempting to understand this important castle, we're going to try to work out the layout of the town that Edward built alongside it. We're starting in the High Street. Great period piece, Stuart, isn't it? Yeah. Where Stuart and Jonathan are hunting for the remains of the medieval town in the cellars of the oldest houses dating to the 18th century. <laughs> Doesn't do it to be too tall down there. <laughs> oh, it? limbo champion. Right. A variety of different sort of stonework and stuff down oh, here. Oh, I like this, Graham. Uh, this is stone yeah. and soft mortar. Yeah. Look, look there, look, see? It's, it's powdery stuff. Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, but you could, you've got powdery, bricks yeah. there as well. Yeah. But those are Tudor dimensions, those. Yeah, Let's have a look. They should be about oh, no. two inches. It's all right, isn't it? Just a little two under, inches, maybe. Two inches, yeah. 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 And then these... Look at that. These are more like three-inch yeah. depth. These are big. Well, all this stuff here is going to be your 18th century house. Yeah. But it's yeah. built on what looks to me like, you know, two other phases yeah. of, of, of construction yeah. and right the way down the bottom there, you know, I think we're back into the Middle Ages. And your cellar could be the last vestige <laughs> of Edward III's building. So, by the end of day one, we found the first signs of the medieval town of Queenborough. And back at the castle, we've got part of the rotunda in Trench 1, and Trench 2 has expanded most of the way down the mound. 
As you can see, we've started digging this trench in earnest now, but there's a big problem. This is a scheduled site, so we've got to respect and scrutinise every little feature that we come across. And near the surface, most of these features are likely to be later rubbish tips, stuff like that. And we know, because we've seen it in that trench over there, that two metres down is the castle. So there's this real tension between how much we examine the surface stuff and the fact that we've only got three days to find out what we can about the whole castle. But there is this feature here, isn't there? Indeed. Um, I think we've just got a vague indication that we could be on the top of a masonry spread. If you look over here, with the eye of faith, if you squint just a little bit, you could be on top of a wall line, the outer curtain wall of the castle. We'll have to see. This is one KG archaeologist. <laughs> but we know we've got the inside of the castle over there. Maybe, just maybe, we've got the outside here. We'll know tomorrow. Beginning of day two here on the Isle of Sheppey, where we're excavating the last royal palace in England. And yesterday, the temperature got up to over 32 degrees. So, as you can imagine, digging was rather inhibited. But the temperature's dropped a bit today, so we're putting most of our resources into this long trench, where we're hoping to find the outside wall of the castle. Yeah. Round about here somewhere? Yeah. You see those two concrete blocks? So they're modern, aren't they? They're modern, but they might actually mark the site of this, this sort of edge coming round. Yeah. And then beyond that, of course, should be the moat of the castle. Around about here? Yeah. The moat seems to be full of masonry, which looks like it's part of Edward III's castle. But we won't know which bit until we've pulled it all out. Over in Trench 1, Phil and Bridge are trying to make sense of the wall they found yesterday. I think it's pretty straight. Is it? I know. Think. Engage brain, Phil. Now then, going on it being sort of in that neck of the woods, we got maybe that curving wall is going to be that, yeah. and then this one going off is going to be that. If Phil's right, he's found this part of the inner wall of the rotunda. Now to find the outer wall. In trench two, we've removed some of the masonry dumped in the moat. There's another one of these blocks coming down now, look, Jonathan. They're all the same, Mick, aren't they? They've all got huge, the same curve. Aren't they? Yeah. And what do you think they well, are? Well, I'm just looking at the stone there. You see where it's split away? It looks green. It's, uh, I think it's Rygate stone, Surrey stone. Right. And it's in the records, isn't it, for the 1360s yeah. building? Yeah. That's the crucial thing. But what do you think it is? Because a lot of it's got this curve on it. Look at this one here, look at that one. Well, it's all the same. It's from one feature, I think. Right. Uh, I was thinking stair, uh, maybe a stair vice, you know, turreted staircase. The other possibility, I mean, is that it, it's something like the well. We know there was a well on the top, but we know uh, that's been altered. Um, I wonder if it could be that. Because that could be an overflow, couldn't it, for water? Or it looks like through. a water channel, doesn't it? What worries me, though, you look at what's coming out with this stuff. You've got plastic bottle. Is that antifreeze? Yeah, I mean, it, it suggests that, you know, it, this has all been dumped fairly recently. The materials to construct the castle in the 1360s would have been brought up the creek leading from the River Swale, which runs round the west side of the island. You got to remember in the 14th century, all this was, was an island. It was completely surrounded by water. It was all... The Isle of Sheppey itself was known from Anglo-Saxon times as the Isle of Sheep. And Edward III built the economy of his new town of Queenborough on the wool trade. That will be a real deterrent. From the river, you can begin to appreciate the strategy of placing the castle in this location. Stu, if the French had attacked here, where would they have come from? They'd have come from the open water, which, which is out there, Tony, and set, sort of sailed in the direction where we're moving in now. The Isle of Shep is almost like one of the first landfalls if, you, if you're wanting to, to invade this, this mm. part of the southern England. So if you were coming down here and you wanted a safe anchorage, somewhere to, you know, to, to base your, your fleet or, or to land, you need somewhere sheltered to do that. And round the corner where the swale goes round is a, is a safe place. And that's where 
the castle was placed. I mean, can you see where the church tower is? Stand, and that's not yeah. a very high church tower. So you can imagine there's a big castle standing behind it, dominating the landscape. I mean, if you were a Frenchman sailing up here, would you want to try and land there with that big castle? I don't think I would. Presumably they realised how strategic it was when they were building it there. Oh, I think so. We've looked at Edward III's foundation charts and we know from that uh, the king was acutely aware of the maritime importance of the site. The charter talks about a deep and broad arm of the sea where ships can be put in at. So they're certainly aware of the significance. Back on dry land, Raksha is exposing the curtain wall and the moat. And other features in Trench 2 are providing us with some interesting finds. This is fantastic for the site because it's medieval pottery, it's shell-tempered ware, um, and it dates from 1200 right through to 1500. And there's so many varieties of it, but we've actually got two different types of pot coming in here. This one here, which is a rim shirt, but it would have been a large or relatively large bowl. Whilst we've got this one, which is more of a dish-shaped Object. This stuff that you'd have in your house then? Yeah, it's common stuff. I mean, everybody would have used it for cooking, for using on the table. It's not high status. And what about all these shells? I mean, it looks like the only thing they're eating was oysters. <laughs> yeah, they ate oysters by the bucket load. Yeah. It's, I mean, they lived by the sea, it's all they ate. And some historical sources actually say they got so fed up with eating them, they didn't want to see them anymore. <laughs> but so this is pretty typical of, of this of It's very typical of everyday life. Perfect for the period we're meant to be working in. Yeah. At the same time as Edward III was building this innovative castle in Queen Philippa's name, the accounts state that he commissioned the church, said to be the only surviving medieval building in the town. Absolutely. You know, if Edward III's building for Philippa, a new yeah. church here for her honour, I mean, you could have done better than build what looks like a barn with vertical crazy paving. I, I, I've rarely seen royal building, fr frankly, this bad. The windows are the wrong shape, the door is the wrong shape. It's, it's, it just doesn't feel 14th century to me. And there's one school of thought by Hasted, the county historian, who reckons that it was all rebuilt in the 17th so, century. Yeah, which was so it looks like none of Edward's building work survives intact. And there is something in there of the 17th century, actually, that might interest you. And it's this little beauty. Oh, a magnificent font. Isn't it? A font, 1610 and it shows the postern gate of the, of the castle. Which was still standing when this font was made by mm. that day. Mm. What do you think? It's beautiful. It's very rare to find an impression of a castle's back gate. We still need to sort the orientation of this castle out. Look, I'm and if we can sure work out which way it faced, we should be able to locate it. I think we've got some pretty strong clues, Marcel. I mean, right. The first clues we've got is from the History of the King's Works itself, yeah. where it describes the outer gate and postern to west and east, i.e. outer gate to west, to west. and postern to east. Right, to so east. that's going to be like that with north up here. That's right. Yeah. That also ties with the, the map evidence we've got when the, the site was actually standing as earthworks, which had a, a gap here, which was probably the, the postern, one, yeah. but this, the main gateway and the, the outer area here, that would be firmly under the, the school car park there, where we've got the dining bus and, and catering and everything. Right. What about you, Oliver? The clue is this place over here, Minster. Basically that, over, that's, over that's that way over behind that way. us. So that's a view from the west then, isn't it? Now, so the west. records indicate that the castle faced the west. And John's got a suggestion for a trench that would help us confirm it. What we want is something to investigate this rotation. Yeah. And look, this is where the eastern gate is. And look. Oh yes, good you can see. It's like a bit of wall, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. How about if we do a trench? That's the logic. On that line, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. try and tie that down. So trench three will attempt to locate the corridor, which would confirm that the castle faced the west. Just hold on for a couple of seconds. Here. I'm just going to quick look down here. That's going back onto this stony rubble. But it might not be as solid a wall if it's just marking a road. Way yeah. Or, yeah. Meanwhile, Phil's extended trench one by 13 metres in his bid to find the outer rotunda wall. Phil? Yo! How are you getting on? Well, I've uh, lost my castle, mate. <laughs> You've lost the castle? That's very careless of you. What's going on? <laughs> Oh, no, well, you see, 
we're supposed to have along this side here somewhere the front of the rotunda. Now, if you look behind you, look, there's that road iron. Ah, right, yes. It ought to come through clay. here somewhere, and all we got is clay. I mean, is this natural that you've got here, this, this clay? Well, it looks it, but it's got chalk in it. Oh, yeah. Shouldn't have chalk in the clay. No, so it's contaminated with something. It's dumped right. then. Yeah. Mm. Phil's going to need to find the elusive outer wall if we're going to work out how big the castle rotunda is. The residents of Queenborough are proving incredibly keen to get involved. So that main gate has become the car park. Offering us the benefit of their local knowledge and bringing objects that they've found. These are, these are quite interesting to some people. They're into the military idea, aren't they? Yeah, they are. I mean, these are brilliant. I mean, you've got musket balls, you've yeah. got pistol balls, and they date to around about 17th century onwards. Yeah, that's So true. that's yeah. really nice. But yeah. also, you've got some items dating, actually, to the medieval oh, yeah. period oh, yeah. here. Yeah. Um, in particular, this item, yeah. which is part of a large cooking pot, yeah. and this is the handle from it. And it yeah. would have dated to the later medieval period. That would be... So, when, round about when this was still in occupation. Yeah. By tea time on day two, Raksha has uncovered a good chunk of the curtain wall which surrounded the entire castle. This is basically the extent of it here. Yeah. We still have some of the stones uh, packed in the bottom but the rest of it, it's just gone. This, this doesn't look as big as I expected, Oliver, on that History of the King's Works no. plan. It looks absolutely massive. It looks to me as if the front portion of the wall has actually gone, so the wall would have been a lot wider, but it's still a pretty, pretty decent medieval wall. It may only be half its original size, but at least we now know where the curtain wall is. Though we still need both walls of the rotunda to work out the scale of the castle and Phil's throwing everything at it. There's no sign of this outer wall, Phil. Strange, isn't it? Well, if it's in a metre of where I'm surveying, we'd see it. You would have thought it ought to have been there, though. I mean... That's there. <laughs> John, just disconnect and go <laughs> away, will you? <laughs> During Edward's reign, Queenborough and its castle enjoyed a brief period of wealth. But after that, it became more famous for a succession of disreputable mayors and eccentric happenings. Queenborough is the kind of place that's just awash with bizarre stories. And my favourite is about a chap called John Taylor, who was a Thames ferryman and called himself the Water Poet. And in the year 1614, he made this extraordinary journey from London all the way to Queenborough in a boat made of paper. And to help us recreate that magical moment, I've got a pair of nutters here. This is Abs and this is Tim. Tim, why did he do this bizarre journey? He was always doing bizarre journeys like this, Taylor. He walked barefoot to Edinburgh to borrow uh, a pound from Ben Johnson, the playwright, for a pint of beer. I think the, the paper boat was probably his most successful mission. So how are we going to make this boat made out of paper? We've taken some hemp paper, which is what Taylor used, and um, got a bit of an example here of this uh, sample I've done with a bit of brown paper. We're going to stick it together, lacquer the surface of it. What do we lacquer it with? We've used uh, a traditional kind of lacquer that he would have had at the time. Yeah. So uh, here's a tiny model we made earlier. Oh, you're kidding. No, I'm not. We're really going to make we that? We really are going to make that. How? You can give us a hand, if you'd be so kind. Yeah. If you care to just hold that corner there. Okay. And we're going to fold that end over, get it up level with the other side. And if we can just lift that up for a moment, you begin to get yourself a boat shape. It is boat shape. It is a pretty shape. I have to say, it's pretty floppy. We're hopefully going to have some, some rolled up tubes, like sort of extended toilet rolls, to yeah. sort of hopefully. You may think together. that is ridiculous, though. Wait until you see the oars, for the oars are yeah, made. Right. What we're trying to do is Taylor used uh, oars made out of. <laughs> so Here we have got. <laughs> a piece of dried cod. Taylor's oars were big, dried stockfish, but we, 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 we've gone as close as we possibly can to them. And uh, they're, they're what are hopefully going to propel us through the water. God, it's not stink. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> Hasn't That's... British television gone downhill? <laughs> uh, nice. 
back to relative sanity and Kerry's trying to fit together again the curved stones that we found in the moat. And they seem pretty convincing as part of the medieval well which would have stood in the centre of the castle. Most of the masonry was sold off after the castle was demolished in 1650, which could explain why there's no sign of the outer wall of the rotunda in Trench 1. But we're having more success with the inner wall. Phil, what have you got there, mate? Got the turn of the wall, Mick. Oh, wow. Let's have a look. Look, that's what we had before. Yeah. With that edge coming that way. And now, look. We've got another one coming this way now. I'm just wondering where that fits into the plan. Well, see, what I want to do is I want to strip all that lot out. Yeah. To find out whether that wall actually continues on through. Or whether it turns. Or whether it stops yeah. and, and literally just turns. If the wall does turn, it could be the entrance to the rotunda. This was linked to the postern gate by the corridor which Matt's been looking for in Trench 3. Well, it looks like we've got the beginning of a wall here. It's not as substantial as the ones we've had elsewhere on site, but look, we've got all the stones here, mortar. It looks like it's been layered up with clay in between. Right. And on this side of it, coming straight down here, is this huge ditch. So is that what you'd expect to see with the geophysics that yeah, you've got? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we could be onto it. The wall goes with the high resistance there in red. Yeah. And that's through on that line. Right. Just as we expected. The thing is, there should be a second wall, probably five metres that way. If we can confirm that, then we've got the line leading right into the centre of the castle. All the bits of the castle jigsaw are beginning to come together now. We're starting to get an idea of its size. We even think we know which way it faced. But tomorrow we're going to dig here, which is this, which, if we're right, would have been the big central facade of the castle, the place that would have confronted King Edward and Queen Philippa when they swept into it. But, as I say, that's if we're right. We're into our final day at Queenborough on the Isle of Sheppey, where we're investigating the castle Edward III built for Queen Philippa. One of the great things about this dig has been this lot, who've not only been watching what we're doing for the last three days, but they've been talking to us and bringing stuff in. And one of the things that a local historian brought us has turned out to be golden. It's this picture of the castle, which is unlike anything else that we've seen so far, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, if that's what the inner courtyard looked like, it was very grand. So where is that on our drawing? I think it's actually this little turret sticking out into this inner courtyard. And it would be the first thing you see as you came up this entrance. The antiquarian reconstructions based on designs of the castle that the artist found in Paris. And although we don't know the exact nature of them, they seem to fit in with the rest of the evidence. So Trench 4 will try to locate what we can see in the drawings. Meanwhile, in Trench 3, we're attempting to confirm the orientation of the castle by locating the corridor into the rotunda. Matt's found one wall and is expanding Trench 3 to find the other. Everyone has been saying for the last couple of days how unique this castle is, but I don't really get a sense of what that uniqueness is. Now, most royal castles are, are multi-phase buildings. They're, they're rebuilt over, over many, many generations. Their plans are added to. Queenborough, on the other hand, it seems to be a single-phase castle. It's planned in one fell swoop. So Edward III seems to be employing his masons to, to impose what's almost an ideal castle onto the landscape. Is this a rather bizarre one-off, or did it actually influence British architecture? And we've got an interesting plan in front of us here. This is Deal Castle, which is down in Kent. It's a couple of hundred years later. It's a, it's a castle built by Henry VIII. If you put the two plans next to each other, you can see there are a couple of features that they have broadly in common. It's basically this idea that they have very, very symmetrical designs. There's a line of symmetry here at Queenborough. It's down the middle. Likewise, at Deal. And also the fact that they repeat circular form. So this is 200 years later, but there's a, there's a level of similarity there. Meanwhile, Matt found some foundations where he was expecting to find the other corridor wall. 
but they look very different from the wall he found yesterday. The two corridors are crucial to understanding the use of the castle. They would have forced any visitors or marauders to take a circuitous route around the outer walls of the rotunda, either exposed to fire or forced to admire the full grandeur of the castle before entering the inner sanctum. Meanwhile, Stuart and Jonathan have been trying to work out the layout of Edward's Queenborough. Okay. Let's get, see what measurement is, shall we? Are, are these things standard? They've identified a property on the high street which looks like it's retained its Two. medieval dimensions. That's about 11 and a half feet. Right. Now they're looking for evidence of similar footprints in other buildings. <laughs> Look at that. That's lovely. Yeah. These yeah. are perfectly good medieval walls to me, actually. This, this is the width. Yeah. So this is a measurement we really want, isn't it? So that is 11 feet. That's very similar to what we measured at number 60, isn't it, on the surface? Isn't it? Oh, that's that's identical. Really, really nice. So the width of the cellar under this Georgian house suggests that three timber-fronted shops would have stood in its footprint when the royal town was laid out in the 1360s. And I think what we've got is a town which has got two different maritime characters, in a way. You've got the bit round the creek here, which is the wharfage, where all the loading, unloading, etc., would be going on for the town, the kind of commercial yeah. backside of it, if yeah, you could yeah, call yeah, it that. Yeah. But at this end, where the high street heads, you've actually got what is a fairly formal approach into the new borough, heading straight down towards the castle. Back at the castle, Trench One is causing chaos. The more Phil exposes of the inside rotunda wall, the more it looks like an outside wall. And that doesn't make sense with any of the other trenches. Let's say we take those two bits of wall down there. Yeah. Right? And we line those up over our two bits of wall there. Then Phil's stuff is actually in a, in a void, in, in an open space. It's not mm. actually on the wall at all. What Phil's got there is a piece of curving wall below the ladder there and then another curving wall coming off it underneath the bucket and the spade, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at that on the plan, <clears throat> the only thing that fits with that is the junction of one of these walls with the main wall of the castle. But well, that you, looks all right. Yeah, but if you put that over the top of that, then none of the rest of it makes <laughs> sense that we've dug up. You can't get it all to square up at all. <laughs> so presumably that either means we're misinterpreting the archaeology or the plan's wrong. <laughs> I'm not sure we're misinterpreting the archaeology because we've looked down this trench for any other sign of any other wall to go with that, and it isn't there. Now you've got another conundrum here as well, because if that interpretation is right, and that's the curve of that, and the well is in the right position, the, and that's the, that's the corner of the wall there and the well there, that distance is only 12 metres, so you've got to fit all that tower, all these rooms, gatehouse, courtyard and well into 12 metres. It won't work, mm, you see. It's like a sand castle skyscraper. Yeah. <laughs> it's <of> tiny people. <laughs> the problem is this damn thing. <laughs> We've been using this for two or three days now and relying on it, and there's clearly something wrong with it. So throughout the whole two and a half days, this has been our one piece of certainty and sanity, and now it looks like this is completely wrong. <laughs> Should be about four metres wide, curving through on this line. If the only thing we can rely on is the archaeology... I'm confident that it's curving, whether it's castle or not is up to you. OK. We have to keep digging. So Trench 5 is located over another part of the rotunda, which might help us work out whether the plan is the wrong size or the wrong shape. Looks like a wall. Further round the rotunda, Bridge has been looking for the grandest part of the castle. You can see behind me, we've got loads of white material here. Basically, it's made up of mortar and it's made up of stone, and just rammed together. Now, we've got three options of what that could be. Either it's intact medieval archaeology. Bit of castle. 
associated with the castle. Mm. Number two could be demolition associated with the castle, dating to about 1650. So what, where people have taken the good stone out and then chucked back all the rubbish and offcuts and mortar. Yeah. yeah, and then use the stone somewhere else. Or okay. well, number three, it could be associated with the construction of the initial pump house that was on the top of the mound here. That's Victorian. That would be Victorian. So you've got 600 years to play with. Yeah, and the only defining feature in this trench is this cut that runs all the way down here. We've got what looks like natural on this side, and then we've got the white material on that side. Bridge is hoping that Jonathan will be able to date the mortar to either the construction or demolition of the castle. I mean, bo both, both are contenders. Either 1650s trash or it's, it's medieval, you know, cheapo wall-filling rubbish. The medieval builders had a kind of cornflake box approach to having two good firm outer walls and you stuff the middle with ill-fitting rubbish that all settles. During the building of the castle. Yeah. Either way, it looks like she's onto the castle and the shape seems to fit the inner rotunda wall, which should help us with the plan. We're almost ready to recreate the final stretch of John Taylor's eccentric paper boat journey from London to Queenborough, where the town welcoming committee awaits. Our boat builders have transformed several layers of hemp paper into a seaworthy vessel complete with oars of dried cod. All we need is for the lacquer to dry. It's taken us two days of really solid work to mess this up this badly. <laughs> I mean, look at it. You're cheating. You, you've got these things. I know. Right. That's perfectly fair. He had buoyancy aids. He had bull's bladders blown up. So we've got four of them. Not bull's bladders, I do accept. Actually, the original tailor had them blown up by women of ill repute because he believed that they were born to be hanged <laughs> and could therefore never drown a bee. And so therefore, logically, he reasoned that their air must float. <laughs> he was a genius. Ready? Ready? Boat. So we're looking to lift and pop her in the water. Look at that. We got water. I'm in. Right, we have a man in the boat. Hang on, I've got a fish at the backside. Hold on a minute. We're listing. We're listing. We must let go of that oar. We're in. No way I'm Okay, we're out in the boat. We have buoyancy. Any problems? Uh, several. One all turns out to be heavier than the other, which we hadn't really accounted for. Are you actually using the buoyancy, or is it just dangling there? No, it's just dangling. The horse could have stayed at home. It could, frankly, have taken the night off. The only problem is we're now drifting past the pier. Anyone for sheer nets? So while Tim attempts a watery U-turn... Next stop, Sheerness. Matt had a change of direction in Trench 3, where he's completely revised his interpretation of the corridor walls. I'll start at this end of the trench. You can see we've dug down a little. We've got this huge cut coming straight in down there. If you follow it back, it comes up again in a straight line there and across here. Right. I thought this was a wall, but I'm not so convinced now because on the other side of it, Actually, coming in here, we've got another big cut that comes in across there and down there. And my current theory is this. <laughs> this is no longer the wall. This is the path in between, ah. straight up to the middle of the right, round. Right. So you had a wall coming across this way and a wall coming across this way. Both the walls, though, have been robbed away. The direction and size of this corridor means that we can now say with confidence that the castle faced the west, looking down the high street and we're hoping that Raksha's wall will help us with the rotunda. Well, if you look here, there's a nice line curving there, and there's another one curving that way, so it's all going around Beautiful. that way. So we can say this is the castle. It's the only big circular structure. The wall curves towards Phil's trench, but sadly doesn't help us identify whether it's the inner or outer wall. So, with just an hour to go, Phil decides to expand Trench 1 towards a geophysical anomaly which could just be the outside of the rotunda. 
that compacted surface and all the stonework is what we're seeing in the resistance. Um, that's, to me, not the outer wall. No, I quite agree with you, John, but what I'm saying is, let's nail this. Come on in, let's get on with it. My Bring money's it. on, that's the outside. I don't care, you're probably <laughs> right. I think you probably are right. See, now we're... Yeah. Curve. There is an edge. There is an edge. There, there is an edge in the one. Is it there? The question is, the edge of what? With all the confusion, Ray Sands' hard work on the model has been a waste of time. So he's begun to work on a computer-generated version of Queen Philippa's castle. Yeah, it brings out really nicely the way the castle. Well, it's like a great wedding cake, doesn't it? We know it's packed with literally scores and scores, fifty or more separate rooms. We know there's a hall, various chambers, a kitchen, guard room, stores, absolutely packed with rooms. Yes, let's not forget we're talking about a major citadel palace. Uh, details such as 407 doors and windows uh, towards its closing stages. These must, some of these must have been of the highest quality. It is, after all, no accident that it perhaps does look like a beautiful chateau with those beautiful pointed turrets because she was, after all, very much a French noblewoman and uh, must have felt, therefore, very much at home here. Having located what could be the remains of the missing outer wall... Oh. Phil's auguring the middle of his trench for signs of the interior of the rotunda. Good Lord alive. I mean, that is a big hole that's been open for a long time. It's filled up with water. The question is, why is there a big hole where there should be a big structure? Of all the trenches that we've dug over the last three days, this is the one that's given us the most problems. Well, yeah, yeah. And we still don't know what's in it, do we? Well, I hate to be contradictory, but I think we do, actually. <laughs> I think what we might have is a very large robber trench going all the way around the top, really? robbing, robbing out the outer line of the rotunda. Because, what makes you think that? Well, on the mapping, we've had this feature, which is a, a wide ditch round the top of the hill, which will come through here at 12 metres wide in places. And I think that's what we can see here in the cut and over the far side in the cut. And what we've got is a huge great robber trench digging all that out. And we actually have a bigger castle than what you've been thinking. Yeah, but Phil's trench, Stuart, shows a, a circular feature, doesn't it? With, with yeah. a wall coming up to it. Now, these are the only circular features <laughs> That's on the, the only plan. thing that makes sense mm -hmm. with that, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. And the width of this makes it 24 metres, mm. you know, to centre it on the well. Well, Henry VIII fixed up this castle in 1536 and then built Pendennis and St Moors and uh, round the coast Deal and Warmer and they're between 20 and 30 metres this is 24 so why shouldn't this have been a model for Henry where that Phil's trench is the outer wall I'm just going with the archaeology as I see it if you go the... with the archaeology in... you'll have to end up with and the argument continues on right until the last moment when almost three metres below the surface God, that looks like mortar that is mortar. Phil finds a final clue. Well, maybe there is a structure here after all. Stuart was right. The hole in Phil's trench was a massive robber trench from the demolition of the castle. But traces of the cellars under the rotunda were picked up by the auguring. Phil's inner wall was the junction of the inner wall with the gatehouse, and 40 rooms would easily have fitted inside the massive structure of the rotunda. At last, we're able to visualise how this unique and beautiful building would have looked to King Edward and Queen Philippa as they admired their new castle in the 1360s.